Good evening and welcome to our Thursday evening Bible study and we're not meeting in person this evening because <clears throat> we have uh, sickness going on in our family and we need to uh, stay away from people for right now. So um, hopefully you're able to join us here this evening as we continue our study of the Kings of the Divided Kingdom and we're on our 14th lesson and we're going to be looking at uh, King Jehu of Judah, Queen Athaliah, uh, excuse me, I said King Jehu of Judah, King Jehu of Israel, Queen Athaliah of Judah, and Joash of Judah. So we're going to try to get through these uh, three rulers um, here in 2 Kings. Now as we begin here this evening, I just wanted to mention some things about the Assyrian Empire. We haven't really talked much about the Assyrian Empire up to this point in our study of 2 Kings. We have mentioned a little bit about the um, Arameans, which is, they're from Syria. So the, the king of Aram, Aram, the Arameans. Uh, we've talked about them because they're neighbors, direct neighbors to Israel. And we've talked about some of these other kingdoms that we knew about, the, the uh, Edomites, Moabites, and people like that, that we might be somewhat familiar with. But I don't think we've really talked about the Assyrians, at least not in particular, up to this point. But we need to know something about the, uh, uh, the Assyrian Empire now, because their influence and their power and their control is going to be uh, felt from this point on uh, through the history of, of Israel and Judah. So uh, I just want to give you some general information. Um, the Assyrian Empire can be divided into four periods of history. There's the early period that goes from about 2000 to 1800 B.C., there's the Old Kingdom period, which goes from about 1800 B.C. to 1300 B.C. There's the Middle Kingdom. It goes about from 1300 to 1100 B.C. 1100 B.C. Now we're getting into the time of Saul and David. And then there's the New Kingdom. It goes from 900 to 600 B.C. about or thereabout. So that's, that's going to be about... Um, the time from Solomon all the way through to the end of the divided kingdom. Actually, it's going to where um, Israel and Judah will no longer be independent political entities. They're, they're going to cease to exist as political entities uh, during this new kingdom period of the Assyrian Empire. Now, let's understand some geography here to understand where Assyria is located at. You can see on the map here, um, in the different colored areas there on the left, um, that's the, the divided kingdom. So I don't know what color that, I'm going to call that color pink there. And uh, if you can look real close at that, if your screen's big enough, you'll see it says Israel. In the blue directly below Israel is Judah. And then the green is Aram or Syria. Okay, so that's that's the key powers that we're dealing with. And then you'll notice toward the upper part of your screen, uh, sort of just off to the right of the center, you'll see that uh, red circle there. This is the area... Of Assyria. This is where the Assyrians come from. And um, you, there's a little city. I sh shouldn't say it's a little city. It looks little on our map here that I have. It's Asher. And this is where the Assyrian Empire gets its name. It gets its name from the city of Asher. And you also see Nineveh there. Nineveh is going to be one of the capitals of the Assyrian Empire. So, um, the Assyrian Empire it, it begins in this area here in this red circle. 
Now, the, the time period that we are interested in for our study is going to be the New Kingdom time period, so 900 to 600 B.C. And during this time period, it, it's a time period where Assyria has influence over Syria. So Assyria influences Syria and Israel, but it doesn't exercise control. It, it, it comes into Syria they fight with Syria, they they win some battles against Syria, but they, they don't have enough power to remain in control in Syria. Syria is a, able to uh, resist them. Um, so they, they can't exercise any control. Now, two of the key kings that we're going to find during this period is Asher... Nasirpol II, you can see his dates there, and Shalmanzir uh, III, or Shalmaneser, some people would say the third. And um, both of these kings are, are attested to by archaeological evidence. Um, here's a picture of Asher uh, Nashirpol the second hunting lions. He's the guy in the chariot there who's who's turned around. He's facing the back. He's got the bow in his hand, and that's a lion that's uh, right there at the back end of the chariot. He's hunting lions there, um, and there's a lion. You can see under the horses. That's another lion there that's already been shot, and uh, so he's hunting lions. And so we, we have some archaeological evidence uh, for this king. Uh, we also have some inscriptural evidence, not scripture, but uh, inscribed evidence. There's writings about him. Um, and uh, Shalmaneser III, he uh, is associated with this obelisk here. And uh, so this obelisk has got... Um, Pictographs, they're, they're pictures that tell a story. You might be familiar with that. And on one of the panels, you can, you can see that we're look, only looking at the front side of it here, or one of the sides here, and you see there's one, two, three, four. There's five panels that go down. They have these pictures. Now, one of these panels is right here. And in this panel, you're going to notice right in the center of that picture, at the bottom of the center, there's a man who is bowed down. The man who is bowed down there is King Jehu of Israel. That's King Jehu, and he's bowing down to Shalmaneser III. And so there is evidence, archaeological evidence, not only for the existence of Shalmaneser III of Assyria, but also um, for Jehu. In fact, um, in the writing, you can, you can see, it doesn't look like writing, but above the picture here, above the images, the, the, uh, the individuals in this image, Right above there, there's a bunch of marks that run across the top of that of our screen. Now that's writing. That's called Akkadian. Um, it's a it's some version of the Akkadian language, and part of what it says there is it talks about Jehu, the son of Omri, uh, the king. So, um, so this is this is connecting. Jehu to Israel, and he's bowing down to Shalmaneser there. Um, and, and so this is going to be in the time period where uh, Assyria has influence. It has certainly powerful influence over Syria and Israel, but it doesn't, it doesn't come in and conquer these areas yet. Um, as we move on out of um, the, the 9th century and we get into the 8th and 7th centuries B.C., Assyria's power is going to grow to the point where they can conquer both Syria and Palestine, and they will even garrison cities in Egypt. And here's, here's a picture, ultimate picture of the Assyrian Empire 
this is this is the Assyrian Empire at the height of their empire. You can see how much area they control. All of the Fertile Crescent, what we would consider Mesopotamia, all the way down through the Promised Land, even into Egypt. And um, it's going to be an Assyrian, uh, Shalmaneser the fifth, who is who's going to be the one that conquers Israel in 722 BC. We talked about that date. I think the last time we met, 722 BC, when Israel is conquered by the Assyrians, and um, the the leader of the Assyrians at that time is going to be Shalmaneser the fifth. And uh, so uh, we're going to be talking about Jehu here this evening. And what we see is that during the reign of Jehu, the Assyrians start to encroach uh, upon Syria and Israel. So that's why it's important to understand the Assyrian Empire. So let's let's take a look at Jehu now. <coughs> going to have to excuse me if I cough a little bit here this evening. So let's look at some of the general information about uh, Jehu. He's the 10th ruler of Israel. Say okay? The 10th ruler of Israel. His dates are from 841 to 814 BC. So this is 9th century uh, BC. He's going to reign for 28 years. And the scripture passage that uh, we're going to be looking at, or the scripture passages that sort of cover his life. Now, these uh, all these verses that are referenced here aren't going to be about Jehu, but they're going to cover his life. He will be around during all this uh, time. So it's quite a few chapters here, almost three whole chapters, chapter 9, verse 1, through chapter 12, verse 21. And, and uh, so this is going to be Jehu, king of Israel. Now let's let's uh, look at some specific points about uh, Jehu. So first, we're going to see in chapter nine, verses one through six, the anointing of Jehu to be king. The the anointing of Jehu to be king. It says in verse one. Now Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Gird up your loins and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now we are a talked about where Ramoth Gilead is. If you can picture uh, Israel, the divided kingdom, Ramoth Gilead is in the far east. Um, it's across on the other side of the Jordan River, so it's on the east side of the Jordan River, and uh, it's right up in the border. It's a border area between Israel and uh, Syria. And uh, so... Elisha tells one of the prophets that is with him, go get your oil and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now, uh, they're there because um, Aram, what we know as Syria, is fighting uh, with Israel there. And so it says in verse 2, when you arrive there, search out Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go to him and bid him arise from among his brothers and bring him to an inner room. Verse 3, then take the flask of oil and pour it, on, pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Uh, then open the door and flee and do not wait. So um, this prophet that works for Elisha is supposed to go to Ramoth Gilead, where uh, Haziel the Aramean is fighting against Israel. And Jehu's he's a commander in the army, and he's going to anoint him. Okay, and now just because just because Jehu's anointed, it doesn't make him king. Uh, remember, just because someone's anointed, that's not the same thing as them actually being the king. Um, king David was anointed well before he became king. And so the anointing is just to say, uh, you're the one that God has chosen for this. You're the one that God has chosen uh, uh, to be king. So um, the uh, prophet leaves. He takes off. In verse 4, it says, And so the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. This is telling us exactly what happened. 
When he came, behold, the captains of the army were sitting, and he said, I have a word for you, O captain. So Jehu is a commander in the army. And Jehu said, For which one of us? And he said, For you, O captain. He arose and went into the house and poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord. The God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord over Israel. So Jehu is going to be king of Israel. Um, in verses 7 through 10, we see that not only was Jehu anointed by God to be king, but that the Lord is going to give him a task. The Lord has a special task for him to accomplish as king. Look at verse 7. It says, you shall strike the house of Ahab your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male person from bond and free in Israel. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. The dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. So the task that the Lord has set for Jehu is to strike the house of Ahab and to destroy it. Now, why is the Lord bringing this judgment upon the house of Ahab? It's because of all the prophets of the Lord that Ahab and Jezebel, his wife, had killed. And so the Lord is going to, the Lord is going to have Jehu kill every male in the house of Ahab. So whether they're, whether they're free or they're slaves, they're all going to die. And the Lord uh, mentions here in verses verse 9 that the same thing that happened to Jeroboam and Baasha, how the Lord removed uh, the kingdom from them, he's going to do the same thing to the house of Ahab. And then he mentions this prophecy here. Uh, this is the second time this prophecy has actually um, been mentioned here, but that uh, Jezebel is going to be eaten by dogs and she's not going to be buried. And so this is the task that Jehu has. This is his divine task. And so after Jehu's been anointed, we see that um, the other captains, the other commanders of the army that were there, they recognized Jehu as the king. So we have the recognition of Jehu as king by the army in verses 11 through 13. Verse 11, now Jehu came out to the servants of his master. So these are the servants of the king. And one said to him, is all well? How's it going? You, you okay? Why did this mad fellow come to you? And, and he said to them, you know very well the man and his talk. So he didn't want to tell them right away. They said, it is a lie. Tell us now. So they said, they said, hey, we know something's up. Tell us what's happening. And he, Jehu, said, thus and thus he said to me, thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. So he didn't want to tell him. Now, you can, you can imagine how Jehu might be a little bit cautious about telling the other commanders of the army of Israel that, hey, he's been anointed as the king of Israel. Israel already had a king, and Jehu wasn't in line to be king. But he finally tells them that, that he's been anointed king of Israel, verse 13. Then they hurried, and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. So they recognize Jehu as king. Now, this sets into motion some things where Jehu will not only um, be anointed as king, but he has to become king. In order for Jehu to become king, uh, Jehoram has to be taken out of the way. King Jehoram of Israel has to be removed. And so, in verses 14 through 26, we see the conspiracy by Jehu and Haziel. Remember, Haziel is the king of Aram. Um, to kill Jehoram. 
Now, keep in mind, they're in Ramoth Gilead, where Israel is fighting Aram, where, Jer where Jehoram, king of Israel, is fighting Haziel, king of Aram. And so it's at this time that Jehu and Haziel are going to conspire to kill Jehoram. So verse 14, so Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Jeho uh, Joram. That's Jehoram, the king of Israel. Now Joram, with all Israel, was uh, defending Ramoth Gilead against Haziel, the king of Har Aram. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to be healed of the wounds which the Arameans had inflicted on him when he fought with Haziel, the king of Aram. So um, Jehoram was at Ramoth Gilead, but he gets wounded. And so he leaves to go back to Jezreel, one of his palaces, to heal. So now Jehoram's no longer there. It's just Jehu and these other commanders who've acknowledged that he ought to be king are there, and they're there with Haziel. So Jehoram's left. In the middle of verse 15, it says, So Jehu said, If this is your mind, then let no one escape or leave the city to go tell it in Jezreel. So um, this is talking about the conspiracy that Jehu has uh, with Haziel to kill Jehoram. So he's saying to Haziel, if this is your mind, um, make sure nobody leaves the city um, and uh, nobody can go tell Jehoram at Jezreel. Don't, no, so they don't want the conspiracy to get out. Verse 16, Then Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram was lying there. Now notice here, Ahaziah, the king of Judah, had come down to see Joram. So Ahaziah, the king of Judah, now goes to see Joram, the king of Israel. So what we have being set up here is Jehoram leaves Ramoth Gilead, and this allows Haziel and Jehu to form this conspiracy. And as a part of the conspiracy, they seal up Ramoth Gilead, so nobody can leave to go warn Jehoram what's about to happen. And so Jehoram is in Jezreel, and while he's in Jezreel, Ahaziah, the king of Judah, comes to uh, visit him. Remember, they're related, they're relatives. So he's going to come visit him. And so they're in Jezreel now, verse 17. Now the watchman was standing on the tower in Jezreel and saw the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram, that's the king, said, Take a horseman and send him to meet him and let him say, Is it peace? So Jehoram might have knew something was up here since Jehu was coming back. And he wants to know, Are you coming in peace? Verse 18. So a horseman went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, What have you to do with peace? Turn behind me. Uh, and the watchman reported. The messenger came to them, but he did not return. In other words, um, Jehu did not let the messenger go back. Verse 19, Then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What have you to do with peace? Turn, uh, turn behind me. The watchman reported, he came even to them and did not return. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. <coughs> Excuse me. So apparently Jehu was known for his aggressiveness, uh, even in driving uh, a chariot, having moving his army very, very aggressively. So, but Jehu did not allow any of these messengers to go back. So now this is going to heighten the awareness of King Jehoram that something's not right. Verse 21, then Jehoram said, get ready. And they made his chariot ready. Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, the king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot, and they went out to meet Jehu and found him 
in the property of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So that's not a coincidence that they are in Naboth's property in his vineyard. Remember uh, the story of Naboth's vineyard with uh, Ahab and Jezebel and how Naboth was killed? It's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence um, that they're in Naboth's property. Verse 22, Then Joram saw Jehu. When Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So it's not peace. So long as the hollow trees of your mother Jezebel and her witch uh, crafts are so many. So Jehu says, as, as long as Jezebel is around and you're all following what she does, there's no peace. Verse 23, so Joram reigned about and fled and said to Ahaziah, there is treachery, O Ahaziah. So Joram knows instantly by uh, Jehu's answer that this is not peace. Jehu has not come in peace. He has come for treachery. He's come to kill him. Verse 24, and Jehu drew his bow with full strength and shot Joram between the arms and the arrow went through his heart, and he sank in his chariot. Then Jehu said to Bidkar, his officer, Take him up and cast him into the property of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For I remember when you and I were riding together after Ahab his father, and the Lord laid this oracle against him. And so he quotes this oracle. Uh, Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, says the Lord, and I will repay you in this property, says the Lord. Now then, take and cast him into the property according to the word of the Lord. And so um, uh, Jehu kills Jehoram, the king of Israel, and he does it by having conspired with Haziel, so that he could leave Ramoth Gilead with his army and go to Jezreel, where Jehoram is at. And so he gets there, and he's being very deceptive. And finally, Jehoram comes out to him. When he comes out to him, he basically tells him, I'm here to kill you. And that's exactly what he does. And he throws his body, the body of Jehoram, in Naboth's vineyard, um, just as uh, the Lord had said would happen. So not only does Jehu kill Jehoram, but we also see that Jehu's going to murder Ahaziah, the king of Judah. This is in verses 27 through 29. Then Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this. Remember, he's there, he's visiting Uncle uh, Uncle Jehoram. He sees Jehu kill him. Uh, It says, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him too, shoot him also in the chariot. So they shot him at the ascent of Gur, which is at uh, Iblim. But he fled to Megiddo and died there. Then his servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his grave with his fathers in the city of David. So so Jehu is, also kills Ahaziah. He murders him. And and verse 29 gives us a little bit of summary of Ahaziah. It says, Now in the eleventh year of of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah became king over Israel. So that's just a summary statement. So Jehu is anointed as king. He's going to be king. He's given the task by the Lord uh, to kill Ahab's house. And he begins doing this by forming a conspiracy with Haziel, the king of Aram, in which it enables him to go to Jezreel and kill Jehoram. After he kills Jehoram, he also kills Ahaziah. Now, he hasn't been given orders to kill Ahaziah from the Lord, but he does it anyway. And so now we're going to see that Jehu begins this bloody path of eliminating the entire house of Ahab. So the next thing we see is the execution of Jezebel. Jezebel, 
verses 30 through 37. When Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. She painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out the window. So remember, uh, Jehoram had went out to um, Jehu, and Jehu killed him outside the city. And so Jezebel hears about this. She's up in her tower, up in her home, and it says she painted her eyes and adorned her head. In other words, um, Jezebel knows what's about to happen to her. She knows she's about to die, so she gets herself all dressed up. She dresses herself up like a queen. You know, she's not going to die like some peasant or common person. She's going to die like the, like a queen. Um, verse 31, as Jehu entered the gate, she said, Is it well, Zimri, your master's murderer? So Jezebel refers to Jehu as Zimri. And uh, you might remember Zimri from 1 Kings chapter 16. Zimri who killed um, King Elah of Israel. And uh, so Zimri killed him. And then seven days later, Zimri dies. And so when Jezebel says this, she's sort of um, indicating that, hey, Jehu, you're just like Zimri. You're, you're this usurper. You're the murderer of your master. And guess what? You might do this, but you're not going to get away with it. Uh, your reign's not going to be any longer than Zimri was, and you're going to end up killing yourself. Remember, Zimri burned the house down around himself. You're going to end up killing yourself. <coughs> And so, so she, uh, Jezebel addresses, addresses Jehu as Zimri. Verse 32, Then he, Jehu, lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And two or three officials looked down at him. So he, he's there, and he says to Jezebel's attendants, Who's on my side? You're going to have to make a choice. Are you with her or are you going to be with me? Who are you going to stand with? And we see the choice that they made in the next verses, verse 33. He said, throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses and he trampled her underfoot. Um, so they threw her out of the tower and from the description here, it seems like she hit the side of the tower on the way down and uh, landed on the ground. And when they landed on the ground, uh, Jehu rode over top of her with horses, back and forth, back and forth with horses. Verse 34, when he came in, he ate and drank and said, See now to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is the king, a king's daughter. So we're going to have to take care of her, but look at verse 35. They went to bury her, but they found nothing more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Therefore they returned and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, in the property of Jez Jezreel, the dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the corpse of Jezebel will be as dung on the face of the field in the property of Jezreel, so they cannot say, this is Jezebel. So what happens, it seems, that uh, after they, they throw Jezebel out of the tower and they run over with horses and everything, there's some time that elapses. Jehu goes in and eats, and while he's um, going in and eating, apparently the dogs come and, and they basically eat uh, Jezebel, just like we heard before would happen, uh, that the dogs were going to eat her and that she would not be buried. And so this, this is what has happened. So here we have Jezebel executed. And uh, Jehu doesn't stop here. Next, we see the annihilation of Ahab's sons. 
chapter 10 now, verses 1 through 11, the annihilation of Ahab's sons. Now Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. And Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria to the rulers of Jezreel, the elders and the guardians of the children of Ahab, saying, Now when this letter comes to you, since your master's sons are with you, as well as the chariots and horses and the fortified cities and the weapons, select the best and the fittest of your master's sons and set him on his father's throne and fight uh, for your master's house. But they feared greatly and said, Behold, the two kings did not stand before him. How then can we stand? And the one who was over the household and he who was over the city, the elders and the guardians of the children, sent word to Jehu saying, We are your servants. All that you say to us, we will do. We will not make any man king. Do what is good in your sight. So Jehu is going to send two letters out to these cities. And the first letter, uh, what we just read about, is he's trying to determine the loyalty of these people. Are they going to be loyalty to the house, loyal to the house of Ahab, or are they going to be loyal to him? And what we see here is that they're going to be loyal to him. So after determining their loyalty, he sends a, another letter, verse 6, another letter where he says, uh, well, since you're loyal to me, you need to cut off the heads of Ahab's sons and send them to me. Verse 6. Then he wrote a second letter, wrote a letter to them a second time, saying, If you are on my side, and you will listen to my voice, take the heads of the men, your master's sons, and come to me at Jezreel tomorrow about this time. Now the king's sons, 70 persons, were with the great men of the city who were rearing them. When the letter came to them, they took the king's sons and slaughtered them, 70 persons, and put their heads in, in baskets and sent them to him at Jezreel. When the messenger came and told him, saying, they have brought the heads of the king's sons, he said, put them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until, tomorrow, until morning. Now in the morning he went out and stood and said to all the people, you were innocent. Behold, I conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? Know then that there shall fall to the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord has done what he spoke through his servant Elijah. So Jehu killed all who remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all his great men and his acquaintances and his priests until he left him without a survivor. So it seems in the, in the last part of this paragraph, after Jehu has had the, the 70 sons of Ahab killed, and it seems that some of them must have been pretty young because in verses 8 and following, what happens is uh, Jehu tries to soften, soften some of this treacherous activity that has taken place. Uh, he, he says to the people, hey, look, you're innocent. I'm the one who conspired against my master. So he takes the blame for conspiring against Jehoram. But then he says, but who killed these, these men? Who killed, who killed these 70 sons of Ahab? Because uh, he, it's as if he's saying he's not the one who actually cut their heads off. So he, he, he's trying to um, skirt the blame for that. Um, but then he goes on to say this had to happen anyway because this was what the Lord said. The Lord said that this was going to happen. This needed to happen. Um, Elijah had spoken this. And so it seems like Jehu is trying to soften this um, treacherous activity that he's been engaged in, trying probably courting favor with the people. I'm, I'm sure the people were not thrilled by the fact that here's uh, 70 sons of the royal household who have just been killed in cold blood. And so Jehu softens this and, and 
when after he does that, he goes on to kill the rest of the house of Ahab that's in Jezreel. So he kills all of his family. But Ahab or um, uh, Jehu doesn't stop there. We see he also murders 42 relatives of Ahaziah. Remember, he's already killed King Ahaziah. Now he's going to kill 42 members of his family. Verse 12. Then he arose and departed and went to Samaria. So that's the capital. On the, on the way, while he was at beth Echid of the shepherds, Jehu met the relatives of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and said, Who are you? And they answered, We are the relatives of Ahaziah, and we have come down to greet the sons of the king and the sons of the queen mother. The queen mother is Jezebel. So it would seem that these are the, this is the royal family, at least part of the royal family of Judah, and they had not yet heard that uh, Ahaziah was dead, along with Jehoram. They hadn't heard that Jezebel was dead, and so they, they were coming up to take part in this royal congregation that they thought was happening at Jezreel. Verse 14, this is what Jehu said. He said, take them alive. So they took them alive and killed them at the pit of beth Echid, 42 men, and he left none of them. So Jehu has the relatives of Ahaziah murdered, 42 men in all. So Jehu's a pretty bloody Pretty bloody guy. Um, and he, he is on a mission. Now, again, just with as with the, the murder of Ahaziah, he was not told to do that. Nor was he told to murder these 42 relatives of Ahaziah. He was only told to um, eliminate, uh, annihilate the house of um, Ahab. So he's going a little bit beyond his mandate here. We see then, next in verses 15 through 17, that Jehu makes an alliance with Jehonadab. Jehonadab. Verses 15 through 17. Now, when he had departed from there, he met Jehonadab, the son of Rechab. He's a Rechabite coming to meet him, and greeted him, and said to him, Is your heart right, as my heart is with your heart? And Jehonadab answered, It is. Jehu said, If it is, give me your hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up into the chariot. He said, Come with me, and see my zeal for the Lord. For he made him ride in the chariot. Verse 17, When he had came to, came to Samaria, he killed all who remained and Ahab to, uh, remained to Ahab in Samaria until he had destroyed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. So Jehonadab, the uh, Rechabite, was faithful to the Mosaic law. We don't have time to do it, but if you would go back and read Jeremiah chapter 35, um, he's mentioned there. And his faithfulness to the Lord is mentioned there. So this Jehonadab has a zeal for the Lord. And what we see Jehu doing is he wants to show Jehonadab he also has a zeal for the Lord. And he's going to show him he has a zeal for the Lord by killing the rest of Ahab's family that is in Samaria. So they were in Jezreel. They killed everybody, all of Ahab's family in Jezreel. Now they're going to go to Samaria, where the capital is, and they're going to kill the rest of the family there. So this is what he does. And, and, he, and he's demonstrating his zeal for the Lord. And then, after he has killed the house of Ahab, now we see the eradication of Baal from Israel. So he's taking care of Ahab, and now he's going to take care, care of the worshipers of Baal. And we see this in verses 18 through 27. I'm not going to read it just for time's sake, but let me summarize it in, in this way. Um, uh, Jehu's going to trick the followers of Baal, saying to them, hey, I'm going to be the main worshiper of Baal here. Here, let's all get together. But he, he does this 
to trick them. Um, he's trying to get them all to come into one place. And that's what he does. He gets them all into one place. And uh, then he stations men outside of the building. Verse 24, he says, Then he went up to the uh, went up to offer sacrifices and burnt offering. Now Jehu had stationed for himself 80 men outside, and he said, The one who permits any of these men whom I bring into your hands to escape shall give up his life in exchange. Then it came about as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering that Jehu said to the guard and to the royal officers, go in, kill them, let none of them come out. And they killed them with the edge of the sword and the guard and the royal officers threw them out and went to the inner room of the house of Baal. So they, they're going to kill all the worshipers of Baal. So they, they not only kill it, but they break the um, temple of Baal down. They destroy all the worshiping instruments and things like that. And so Jehu eradicates Baal worship from Israel. So this is going to be a significant thing. Because remember, worship of Baal had been a constant problem with Israel from the time they began. And now Jehu puts an end uh, to all of it. And so it seems like Jehu, he's on a pretty good track now. He seems like he's doing what needs to be done. He was obedient to the Lord in, in destroying the house of Ahab. He showed a zeal for the Lord in eradicating Baal worship from Israel. But now we see the carelessness of Jehu, the carelessness of Jehu. Verse 28 Thus Jehu eradicated Baal out of Israel. However, as for the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel sin, from these Jehu did not depart. So what exactly did uh, Jehu not depart from? The golden calves that were at Bethel and were at Dan. So Jehu still kept these golden calves and the, the false worship that was associated with them. So that... That's the problem. That's the problem. Now, the Lord recognizes Jehu's obedience in verse 30. It says, The Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in executing what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So he's going to have four generations sit on the throne of Israel because he was obedient to the Lord. But notice verse 31. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord. So he was doing right. He was partially doing right, but he became careless and did not follow the Lord with all his heart. So he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam. And because of this, in verse 32, we see that the Lord began to cut out parts of his territory. Um, Haziel came in and defeated and took part of the territory of Israel a little bit by little bit. And as we get to verse 34 and 30 through 36, we see that Jehu dies. So Jehu seems to be as close to a good king as Israel is going to get. Um, on the one hand, he was obedient to the Lord. Um, but on the other hand, he went beyond the Lord's instructions in some cases, where he killed Ahaziah, the king of Judah, and his family. But he, he did what the Lord had said he was supposed to do in killing the house of Ahab. Uh, and we also see this again. On the one hand, he destroys Baal worship. But on the other hand, he leaves up the golden calves. And, and the problem was, the problem with Jehu was that his whole heart was not devoted to the Lord. Um, he was of a divided heart. And if there's anything we know about the Lord, is the Lord demands complete obedience and loyalty. You cannot have a divided heart with the Lord. Um, to... to uh, have a divided heart with the Lord is not to be for the Lord. Yes, you might do some things that are pleasing to the Lord, but if your 
your heart's not devoted to him, you're also doing some things that are displeasing to the Lord. And this seems to be the, the case of Jehu. And, and so Jehu is, he's about as close as you get to a good guy um, ruling over the house of Israel. Now, now we come to Athaliah. Athaliah. Let's talk about some of the general information about her. She's the seventh ruler of Judah, but she's illegitimate. She's, she's illegitimate. Um, there was nothing in Israel or Judah that allowed for the queen to rule. The throne did not pass to queens or to a princess. It only passed to men. So she's an illegitimate ruler, but she's still a ruler of Judah. She's going to reign from 841 to 835, which is six or seven years, depending on how you count, and basically chapter 11. Basically, 2 Kings chapter 11. It says in verses 1 through 3 here, let's get into specific points. Well, let me remind us this. She's the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, the wife of King Jehoram of Judah, mother of Ahaziah. Remember, and Ahaziah is just dead. He just, he just got killed by Jehu. So she's the mother of Ahaziah. So this tells us that when, when Athaliah is alive, Jehu's alive. She's ruling Judah. Jehu's ruling Israel. So in verses 11, in chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, we see her power grab. It says in verse 1, When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw her son was dead, she rose and destroyed all the royal offspring. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, the sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons who were being put to death and placed him and his nurse in the bedroom. So they hid him from Athaliah, and he was not put to death. So here's her power grab. This is this is this is Ahaziah's mother. When her son dies, she wants the throne. So she has everyone killed who would have a claim to the throne. But Jehoshaphat, uh, the daughter of King Joram, the sister of Ahaziah, so this would be her daughter, the daughter of Athaliah, took Joash, one son of Ahaziah, and she saved him. She hid him so that he wouldn't be killed. So, we see this power grab that takes place. And in verse 3, it says, So he was hidden, that's Joash, was hidden with her in the house of the Lord six years. That's the temple. They, they um, temporarily, temporarily hid him in a bedroom, and now they're going to hide him in the temple for six years while Athaliah was reigning over the land. So six years, they're going to hide him in the temple. So here's the power grab. This is how she gets power. She kills everybody in the way. And then, while she's reigning, we see the preservation of the king. The preservation of the king in verses 4 through 8. Now, in the seventh year, Jehoiada, now he's the high priest. Jehoiada, he had been taking care of Joash, sent and brought the captains of the hundreds of the Karites and of the guard, and brought them to him in the house of the Lord. And he made a covenant with them and put them under oath in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. So he's been keeping Joash in the temple for uh, six years. Jehoiada, the high priest, is doing this. Then in the seventh year, he calls for the royal guard to come. And he says, this guy is the king. And he puts them under oath. 
Now, we might wonder, how did Athaliah not find Joash? Well, remember, in, in the working of the nation of Israel, in this case, the nation of Judah, there's one place that the king is not just free to come and go into. And that one place is the temple. Uh, he does not have the right just to come into the temple. Um, the, the priests would protect the, the temple and its sacred sacredness. So now Jehoiada, the high priest, reveals the king, and, and he is being preserved. And, and notice, notice what he does here in verses 5 and following. He commanded them, saying, This is the thing you shall do. One third of you who come in on the Sabbath and keep watch over the king's house, one third also shall be at the gate of Shore, and one third at the gate behind the guards, shall keep watch over the house of for defense. Two parts of you, even all who go out on the Sabbath, shall also keep watch over the house of the Lord for the king. Then you shall surround the king, each with his weapons in his hand, and whoever comes within the rank shall be put to death. And be with the king when he goes out and when he comes in. So Jehoiada uh, divides up the royal guard into three sections. One section's on the inside, and two sections are on the outside. The one section on the inside, we'll call that the internal guard, seems to be divided up into three groups. Uh, two groups are in the house, and one group is forming a circle around the king. And the instructions are, if anybody tries to break ranks, anybody tries to break through that circle, you kill them doesn't matter who it is, you kill him. So he's protecting the king. And now we see the presentation of King Joash in verses 9 through 12. So the captains of hundreds did according to all that Jehoiada, the priest, commanded. Each one of them took his men who were to come in on the Sabbath with those who were to go out on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada, the priest. The priest gave to the captains of hundreds the spears and shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of the Lord. The guards stood, each with his weapon in his hand, from the right side of the house to the left side of the house, by the altar and by the house, around the king. Then he brought the king's son out and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. So now we have the presentation of King Joash. And Jehoiada is the one who sets the crown on his head. Remember, he's only seven years old when all this happens. And we find that uh, while all this is going on, there was this loud celebration that the king has been um, presented. Well, Athaliah hears this. And this is going to lead to her execution in verses 13 through 16. It says, When Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people in the house of the Lord. So she came to the temple. She looked and behold, the king was standing by the pillar, according to the custom. So this is where the kings would usually stand at the temple, by the pillar. With the captains and with the trumpeters beside the king and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew trumpets. Then Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, treason, treason. So she's saying this was treachery. This was treason. She's the one who should be ruler. So uh, her attention has been attracted because of all this commotion. And now she sees what's going on. Her grandson is still alive. She didn't get, she didn't get this one last uh, grandchild. Verse 15, And Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of hundreds who were appointed over the army and said to them, Bring her out between the ranks, and whoever follows her put to death with the sword. 
For the priest said, let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. So they seized her, and when she arrived at the horse's entrance of the king's house, she was put to death there. So she's executed. So Joash is presented as king. Athaliah comes to see what's going on, and now she is executed. And it's following this that Jehoiada is going to make a covenant, a restoration covenant with the people. Verse 17. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people and that they would be the Lord's people, also between the king and the people. So this covenant, he's getting the people to take an oath that they're going to follow the Lord and that they're going to follow the king, this young king Joash. All the people of the land went to the house of Baal and tore it down. His altars and his images they broke in pieces thoroughly and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars, and the priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord. He took the captains of hundreds and the Karites and the guards and all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord and came by way of the gate of the guards to the king's house. And he sat on the throne of the kings. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet. For they had put Athaliah to death with the sword at the king's house. Jehoash, that's another name for Joash, was seven years old when he became king. Um, well, we're out of time. Just let me say some things in summary. Jehoash is seven years old. Seven-year-olds can't be king. Who do you think ruled? Who do you think ruled the nation? Jehoiada, the high priest. And we're going to see um, some reforms that Joash uh, accomplishes a little bit later when we look at him. And these these reforms of Joash are, are really the result of Jehoiada's influence and uh, decisions rather than Joash's that he's going to make. But we're, we'll have to get to that next week. Um, one thing I want us to consider as we close here in regards to Athaliah. With Athaliah, we see the ultimate consequences of King Jehoshaphat of Judah. You remember King Jehoshaphat of Judah a while ago? He made a treaty with King Ahab and their kids got married. Athaliah is the ultimate consequence of that uh, wicked alliance. She was such a wicked person that she had all of her grandkids killed so that she could have the throne. And it was, it was through this alliance that Jehoshaphat made with Ahab that allowed a foothold of wickedness to come into the nation of Judah. Uh, you know, when Ahaziah died and his mother Athaliah heard that he was dead, the first thing she did was not mourn. The first thing she did was not to see to the who's going to be the successor, who is now going to be the king, the first thing she did was to try to grab power for herself. And she had no right to the throne. The kingly accession only goes through the sons. And if there's no son, it would go to the next oldest brother of the king. It would never go to the queen or the queen mother. So Athaliah was a wicked, wicked person. But it was from that that we're going to see a righteous Jehoiada, the high priest, really come to preeminence. And because of his influence over Joash, we're going to see some um, uh, uh, rest, restoration of the temple and... and um, some revival within the land of Judah. Well, we'll pick up with Joash uh, next week. And again, if you ever have any questions about the things we covered, please feel free to email me 
or text me. Uh, thanks for uh, watching this evening.